we got our hands on the brand new 2023 Pivot Shuttle SL and we got to do a first ride. Now, first of all, you have to excuse me if I sometimes refer to the bike as the Pivot because a Pivot, that's the Norwegian word Pivot, so be warned. This super lightweight bike weighs in at 19.23 kilos with these pedals and with these tires, which aren't the standard tires. The Norwegian distributor sort of cheated and fitted the heavier tires. I say cheated because lightweight MTBs usually come with lightweight tires and they kind of suffer on wet and loose conditions. And uh, that's exactly what we've got now. And we're quite thankful that they fitted those tires. Without pedals, this bike is about 18.9 kilos and the tires are 250 grams heavier than the standard dissector front and rear. So the weight ends up being like 18.6-ish kilos with a tubeless setup. The rest of the specs is an e-bike specific 150 mil travel Fox 36 factory. Rear suspension is noticeably shorter at 132 millimeters. And most lightweight MTBs are usually 150 forks, 140, 150 rear travel. And this bike at about 130 sounds a bit short, but it doesn't feel that way at all. Comparing this bike to 150 mil travel front and rear, and we can't really notice the shorter travel at the back. It, uh, the DW link, a virtual pivot point suspension, it really is so smooth. I used to ride a Pivot shuttle back in the days, the original one, like in 2019. And it sort of has this same suspension feel. It settles down a bit deep in the travel, but it feels really comfortable and it's really nice traction, very good grip. On the old Pivot shuttle, you were sitting a bit too deep into the rear suspension and you weren't getting enough pop from the rear end if you tried to do a small jump. You would sort of feel like the bike would rise, but you weren't really getting any air at the back because you were just extending the rear suspension without getting the rear wheel off the ground. But it's not that way at all with this bike. You still got as that nice settled feeling over rough trails at speed, but it's combined with a nice pop. It's easy getting this bike off the ground. And the rear shock is a Fox Float X factory. Not the big burly X2, but uh, yeah, this is a nice shock too, and the uh, performance really is great. Brakes are a bit strange, sort of. It's the Shimano XT 4 pot brakes, which isn't strange by itself, but looking at the rear derailleur, the drivetrain, it's the SRAM X01. So yeah, not really used to seeing that Shimano SRAM mix, but it's a good one. Great brakes and uh, the SRAM X01. Mechanical uh, shifting, basically flawless, even though stuff is clogged in mud. This bike has got alloy wheels. And this model, the Pro X01, it's number two in the line of four. So the cheapest one is like a uh, Ride XT slash SLX. And this second model in the lineup is the Pro X01. And there are two more expensive models, but the kit on this bike, the specs, it's all I'll ever need. And that's well, because price $9,999. And the dropper post is Fox Factory 2. Nice amount of travel. Fasua come with two different solutions for battery integration. And this one is the integrated fixed one. They've also got a system which is integrated detachable but it adds weight and it adds cost, so yeah. For me, it's very practical with a detachable uh, battery. And now for the motor, the Fasua Ride 60. It's a really small, compact motor. It will amplify your power to up to 350%. It will put out as much as 450 watt max, and it really is a different motor. Had you asked me last year, I would have said it's like nothing else I've ever ridden. But since I've ridden the TQ HBR50, the Trek Fuel EXE motor, and in some ways it reminds me a bit of that motor. It's not as smooth and unnoticeable as the TQ HBR50, but 
then again, it's a more powerful motor. It will uh, give you a higher level level of assistance. So naturally, it will be a bit more twitchy at max power. Pedaling this motor at a steady cadence uh, with a bit of power input, you get really good support. It feels really powerful. Surprisingly powerful for a super light motor. Stepping down the power a bit makes the motor feel more natural. It will uh, improve range. So yeah, that's how it's supposed to be. It can be really powerful. I'll be back with a more in-depth review of this motor with what data and comparing it to other motors and so on. Looking at the rest of the motor components, you haven't got a display, but you've got this flappy thing here. It's a power outtake for a USB-C. And also it's got these lights that will indicate to which assistance mode you're in. White lights are none. Then you've got green, blue and uh, purple for max. And uh, also it will show you like uh, boost or launch control or whatever. If you push the handle of the handlebar remote upwards, the lights will start running upwards and the motor will give you an extra push, an extra boost. And if you just pedal normally, it will last for like a second or two. But if you use it as a launch control, you start standing still, you just start pedaling when you're ready. And if you keep increasing the cadence and keep increasing the power, the motor will stay in this boost mode for several seconds. So this remote thing that some will call it a bit flimsy, I guess, I guess it is, but it works fine. And uh, I didn't manage to break it yet. If you want walk assist, you push till you get to the white lights, which is assistance off. Then you push the handlebar remote inwards towards the center of the handlebars. Push and hold. If you think it's going too slowly, you just shift to a higher gear and speed will pick up. We rode this size large test bike in the low geometry setting and that really isn't that low. Bottom bracket height is 347 millimeters. Head tube angle 65 degrees, head tube 117 millimeters. That's not really that long. Still, the front end on this bike feels really tall and that's due to a lot of spacers under the stem. Even though it felt fine on the trails, I decided to try lowering the handlebars a bit and yeah, I prefer that. Chainstay length for this bike is uh, on the short side, 434 millimeters, and it varies between frame sizes. Not by much, but uh, 432 for the two smaller sizes and 438 for a size extra large. And I mentioned this before, I think it makes a lot of sense varying the chainstay length between frame sizes, because on a bigger bike, the rider will be closer to the rear axle, while on a smaller bike the rider weight will be relatively more forward. And even with a relatively short rear end, the wheelbase for this size large is 1240 millimeters, which is a good length riding the bike then. Yeah, a lightweight M2B, 130 mm travel rear, 150 front, that sounds like a proper all-mountain, all-round trail bike. And sure enough, riding the flatter trails, it's fun, it's nimble, there is a nice pop in the rear suspension to have fun on the mellow trails. Sure, there are other motors that will help the bike climb more efficiently, and sure, there are bikes with longer rear ends that has got a balance more suited for climbing, but still, it is an EMTB and it climbs fairly well. Where it excels though, despite the relatively short rear travel, is on the descents. The ride feel is just so settled and composed on the rougher trails. And it's really responsive. Handling is sharp, it's steering is fast. This is a surprisingly good bike 
on the descents. And the rear suspension has a lot to do with that, with that composed, settled feeling. When riding a lightweight MTB, the impression I'm usually left with is that you're sacrificing a bit of downhill performance to have a really lively and fun bike. But on this bike, if there is any kind of sacrifice, it might be it's not the most capable climber. For everything else, it really impresses me.